Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Much. Thank you everyone for your kind and warm welcome. I'm really happy to be here. So yeah, we have a little bit of time this evening to meditate and I was thinking what we could meditate on. And then something I read this morning triggered a thought. So let's see, we'll go in that direction and see where we end up. Uh, but we'll just offer some prayers first. Om Ajnana Timiran Tasyajnana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyayevacha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavayo Namo Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhyaya Shri Vasudeva Gopakarmena Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 live in this world and we have so many things to do every single day, isn't it? Uh, of course, uh, Thursday and then Friday and then it's very joyous because the weekend comes and then we're freed from so many duties. But it's explained that this world is a reflection of the spiritual world. And so whatever goes on here day to day, even the stuff that happens Monday to Friday. Uh, it's also going on in the spiritual world in its own way. So this morning I was reading about the spiritual world and I was reading about um, Krishna's most confidential devotees, the gopis. And sometimes it's explained that because they are living in a, a, a Vaishya family, so Vaishya family means they're protecting cows and they're they're milk maidens, they're gopis. And therefore, what they often do during the week is they'll go to the village. And what they'll do in the village, in the village town, the center, is they will go and they will sell their dairy products, um, calling everyone like they do, and uh, inviting everyone to buy some milk or buy some yogurt or buy some butter. So in this beautiful verse, it explains uh, what happens sometimes when the gopis go to the uh, village town center to sell milk, dye, butter, and so on. Vikretu kama kila gopa kanya murari padar pita chita vritti dadyadi kammo havasada vochad Govinda Dhamo Dharamadabeti Maybe you get an idea of what happens. <laughs> so they go into the town centre, into the village, and they go with pots and pots of milk, yogurt, butter, dai. Um, and then they put it down, and then they invite people to come and buy. So they're supposed to be shouting out, Anyone who wants milk, anyone who wants dai, anyone who wants any milk products, uh, they are for sale here. But the translation here tells us what actually happens. Though desiring to sell milk, dai, butter, etc., the mind of a young gopi was so absorbed in the lotus feet of Krishna that instead of calling out, milk for sale, 
she bewilderedly she be bewilderedly said <coughs> govinda damodara and madhava that's where i that was very very beautiful thinking of krishna's lotus feet in her mind uh, she almost uncontrollably it wasn't even a conscious thing she almost uncontrollably just said govinda madhava uh, even though she had gone there for a purpose because krishna's lotus feet had become instilled within her mind and within her heart so it got me thinking about krishna's lotus feet and how we can become attached so attached to krishna's lotus feet sometimes people say like it's so difficult to remember krishna in the midst of so many daily affairs and distractions but then what when someone once asked me that question what i said to them is imagine all of those distractions would be gone uh imagine your whole day would open up and you would have nothing to do would you be able to remember krishna throughout the day uh, not maybe not because maybe the problem is not the distractions but the problem is that we don't have enough absorption in krishna because when you have absorption in krishna even if there are so many distractions and duties as we see here Krishna will always come to the forefront and maybe if we don't have absorption even with all the perfect conditions uh maybe Krishna will not come to our mind and therefore somehow or other to be close to Krishna's lotus feet one poet in the vallabha tradition he says Krishna is like a fisherman who casts the net of maya out and all the fishes in the sea get caught except the fishes that are swimming right next to his lotus feet <laughs> so if you're not close to the fisherman's lotus feet <laughs> then you're going to get caught in the net of the maya so how to become uh, close to krishna's lotus feet so i thought this evening we could meditate on krishna's lotus feet now krishna's do you know why krishna's feet are compared to the lotus do you know what's special about the lotus the lotus feet of krishna there are so many beautiful flowers in vrindavan in the vraja forests but why do you think krishna's feet are compared to the lotus anyone has an idea there could be many reasons yeah very good yeah it's explained that the lotus is in the middle of the water is in the middle of the lake yet despite being surrounded not one drop can remain on the leaf of the lotus and therefore the lotus never gets uh, sullied or never gets dirty or never gets contaminated and therefore krishna's lotus feet or the lotus feet of the pure devotees or anything about the transcendental personalities are always compared to a lotus because a lotus despite being surrounded by imperfection always remains uh, perfect and therefore krishna when he puts his lotus feet in the uh, material world they remain transcendental he remains transcendental and the pure devotee in the same way when the pure devotee steps into amsterdam <laughs> uh, the pure devotee's feet remain the lotus feet because it doesn't matter or london as well <laughs> uh, because they are always perfect always transcendental so krishna's feet are lotus feet and krishna's feet have 19 signs on them let's see how many we can get between us <laughs> there are 19 different signs on krishna's feet anyone want to give me one conch. to start us off conch, conch. okay good a lotus lotus 
Like, okay, if we get to 19, I'm going to be super impressed. With you. <laughs> Definitely going to come back to Amsterdam. <laughs> Umbrella. Okay, Nilamba, if we get a double, you have to tell us, right? Umbrella, okay? Chakra? No. Sudarshan Chakra, yeah? A plow? Plow? <laughs> Not a plow, no. Like a goad? Goad? Oh, yes. A castle? Or castle? Yeah, something like a castle. Not on Krishna's. Cow horns. Cow. No. We're getting creative now. <laughs> fish, fish, fish. Seven. Any others? Do you remember? Hoof of a cow. Hoof of a cow? Yeah. Bow? Yeah. Bow? Nine. Isn't there like a grain or something? Barley corn? Yeah. Pots? 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 11? Oh wow, you're getting close. Swastika? Swastika? Good. 12? Okay, 12. Maharaj, is there a gut as well? Gut? Yeah, yeah, we got that. Gutta? No, not gutta. This kind of ring? Ring? Oh, yes. Two concentric circles. A bow we got? Yeah. <laughs> for the elephant, this thing for the elephant. There's the a yantra one side of the... Yeah, there's two octagons. Yeah, right. Two what? Two what? Uh, two squares to make an octagon. And the other side fish. Fish we got? Yeah, you guys are good. 14. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Moon? Yeah, 15? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you did good, you did good. 14, that's good. That's good. Here we go. This is, these are Krishna's lotus feet. Can you see? Yeah. I think the ones you missed were the triangle, the um, jambu fruit, rose apple, the thunderbolt. You didn't get the thunderbolt. The flag. I don't think the flag you got. The flag you got. The lotus, you didn't get the lotus. We got the lotus. Yeah. 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 Spear, I think. Okay. Yeah. Spear. This is a gold. Oh, no. oh. These are Krishna's lotus feet. So it's very, very beautiful. It's said that each one of these aspects of Krishna's lotus feet have a very, very deep meaning. So we'll quickly go just to share with you a little bit of the meaning. Because when we surrender to Krishna's lotus feet, when we bring Krishna's lotus feet into our heart, which really means absorbing our minds in serving Krishna, then these things all have an effect on our life. So let's start here. The first thing here by Krishna's uh, right toe is a barley corn. A barley corn is very, very uh, significant because it's said that when one surrenders to Krishna's lotus feet, then just as a barley corn or grain gives nourishment, gives energy, gives vitality. So similarly, when one surrenders to Krishna, when one brings Krishna's feet into their heart, then their whole life becomes nourished. In other words, they get energy, they get enthusiasm. They feel when the alarm clock goes off in the morning, they feel like, yes, I'm ready. They jump out of bed. <laughs> they say the best alarm clock in the world is purpose. <clears throat> so when you have purpose, when you have something amazing to do, then you naturally have energy. And so the barley corn represents how a devotee becomes full of nourishment, full of hunger for life. You know, many people in their life, they've lost the hunger. It's very interesting. There's one a very famous book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Has anyone ever read that? It's by someone called Viktor Frankl. And he was basically in the concentration camps in the, you know, in the time of Nazi Germany. And so he was in this concentration camp and every single day... He was seeing people around him being killed. 
And so then he began writing his journals, his observations. Later on, he, he managed to escape and those uh, become, became published. But one of the very, very famous lines he writes in his book is he says that he says, every single thing can be taken away from a human. But the last human freedom is the freedom to be enthusiastic about life. And he said that in that concentration camp, everything was taken away from those individuals. But when they lost their enthusiasm for life, that signified their death. And he said, therefore, even though I was surrounded by these things, I never lost my enthusiasm for life. And therefore, this, having this hunger, this enthusiasm to wake up in the morning and this energy to do something, this comes when we have purpose. And we have purpose when we surrender to Krishna's feet. This barley corn gives us this nourishment, this excitement in our life. Then the second thing here is a chakra, Sudarshan chakra. The Acharyas, they say this represents different things, but essentially the chakra does, um, well, we can say two things and it represents a third thing. The two things it does is it cuts and it illuminates. So the Acharyas say when we take Krishna's lotus feet in our heart, then the first thing is it kills the six enemies. Like sometimes we look at ourselves and we think, when will I overcome anger? When will I overcome lust, envy? Actually, we can't. Only Krishna can do it. Only Krishna Sudarshan Chakra can cut those anartas. It's too difficult. It's too deep-rooted. But what we can do is show our sincerity, show our desire, show our, um, yeah, our heartfelt um determination and then Krishna then reciprocates with that by releasing the Sudarshan Chakra and cutting all of these bad qualities while we have these bad qualities we can't really live life we're imprisoned by our own emotions like I really love this story of Mandela who came out of prison after being you know unjustly um, charged in that way and then one devotee offered him the Bhagavad Gita and he said, no, no, I already read it. One of my inmates, my fellow inmates in prison gave me a Bhagavad Gita. And so the person said, did you read it? He said, yes. So the person said, what did you learn from the Bhagavad Gita? He said, I learned that the day I came out of prison, the day I walked free from those prison bars, if I didn't simultaneously give up my bitterness, my anger, my uh, my feelings of negativity towards my perpetrators then even though being free from the prison i'd still be in prison mm -hmm. so to really this is what bhakti tirita maharaj talked about when he spoke about die before you die mm -hmm. that unless you kill lust anger greed envy you can't really live life and so krishna sudarshan chakra comes and cuts all of those things and then it said the Sudarshan Chakra represents illumination of knowledge. And then it said that the Sudarshan Chakra also represents time. And therefore, when you take Krishna's lotus feet in your heart, you become timeless. What does it mean to become timeless? Time means that thing which uh, takes away what is very dear to you. Time, Krishna says, I'm the eternal destroyer of everything. So with time, Krishna takes away all of those things that are dear to everyone in the material world. People, situations, possessions, positions, abilities, beauty. Um, time takes away everything. So when we say a devotee becomes timeless, what it basically means is that they become so detached from all of these temporary things that time can no longer have any effect on them. Time no longer affects their mentality. 
because they've gone beyond time. They've gone beyond the temporary uh, transitory things of this world. They're situated in the eternal reality and therefore time and its uh, effect to bring someone down don't affect them any longer. So this is the Sudarshan Chakra. The umbrella, what this represents is that Krishna is always giving protection. Krishna uh, used something as an umbrella in Vrindavan. Do you remember what that was? Govardhan Hill. <laughs> And it said that Govardhan was lifted for seven days, isn't it? And it said that these seven days and the lifting of Govardhan for seven days has a very deep meaning. Because in the scripture, there is a verse. Devarshi Bhutapta Nrinam Pitrinam Nakinkaro Nayam Rini Charajan. We think in this world that we have different protectors. So some people think the devas, they're my protectors, the demigods. Some people think the rishis, the priests, or those who can, um, uh, you know, uh, the different Vedic darshans, these are my protectors. Bhuta, different living entities, we think they're my protectors. Apta, relatives, we think they're my protectors. Nrinam means powerful people, or leaders in the world. We think they're our protectors. Uh, Pitrinam, our forefathers or other uh, predecessors, we think they're our protectors. Or the mind, the body, the soul, we think they're the protectors. So most people think they're protected by these seven things. But the Acharyas say Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill and protected the Brajabhasis for seven days to teach them that these seven protectors are not actually your protectors. The only protector is Giriraj, Govardhan or Krishna, the Supreme Person. And the others are simply the instrumental um, protectors who work under Krishna's uh, jurisdiction. And so the umbrella represents the protection of Krishna. I'll go a little fast because there's so many. The lotus... Is very very beautiful. The lotus could represent many many different things but one very very special quality of the lotus is it's very very soft and when in you go into a soft place then you never want to move. <laughs> Just like a bed. Uh, very easy to get into, very hard to get out of. <laughs> so when you sit on something soft, or isn't it? If someone is, one time Brahmananda Prabhu was in the back of the taxi with Srila Prabhupada. And you know, Brahmananda Prabhu was, yeah, he was big. And Prabhupada had gone for a whole day of preaching. And finally Prabhupada was so exhausted that he started dozing off. <laughs> And then eventually he just came into Brahmananda Prabhu's lap. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's nice to sleep on someone's belly. <laughs> and he said, oh, my spiritual master was just sleeping there in front of me. So it's very nice just to sometimes sleep in a soft place. Mm -hmm. So it said Krishna's lot feet are like lot, they're very soft. Because once you find your refuge there, uh, it's so soft, it's so beautiful, uh, you don't want to move anywhere else. You know, like when you move into this world, we maneuver ourselves in different places in this world, but we never quite find a comfortable spot. It's all right for some time and then we start getting like a backache or something, <laughs> some problem, some difficulty. No spot in this world is ever completely comfortable. But Krishna's lotus feet are so soft that once you rest there, uh, you're like, that's it. I don't need to go anywhere else. It's beautiful. <laughs> so that's one explanation of the lotus. The flag is really important. Because it said that a flag also represents a declaration. So they, it said that like there's a flag on Krishna's lotus feet because Krishna makes a declaration. 
isn't it? Like Krishna says, Kondeya Patijani Di Naya Pakta Pranashati. So the flag on Krishna's lotus feet is like Krishna's declaration that we're signing a contract and I will never um, I'll never let you perish. It's a formal agreement. It's, uh, it's set in stone. Um, so the flag holds that formality of that commitment that Krishna makes to the devotee. The goad, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a goad. A goad is used to like um, kind of uh, herd animals and particularly an elephant. So the elephant um, goad, the elephant is compared to the mind because the elephant is very very strong very very powerful sometimes the elephant doesn't even know its own power we don't even know the power of our own mind um, and the gold of krishna on krishna's lotus feet signifies that when we surrender to krishna that's the only way in which we can bring our mind into control we can bring our mind into a peaceful state uh, there's no other pacif and nothing else that will pacify the mind, only uh, Krishna's lotus feet. Thunderbolt um, is very, very powerful. Uh, the thunderbolt, uh, it can represent different things. But uh, there's one personality who has a thunderbolt as a weapon. Who's that? Indra. Indra has a Vajra. He has as a weapon. So it said that when Indra holds the Vajra, then he becomes like, you know, like the most exalted, the most like, um, yeah, achieves the highest position. So it's also said that the thunderbolt is on Krishna's feet because when we uh, take Krishna's feet in our heart, then, uh, then we also achieve that exalted position. Um, and therefore the thunderbolt is there. Oh yeah, the other one that we didn't mention, you see this? This line is here. See that line? Mm -hmm. That line is also a special marking on Krishna's feet. Because it said that line represents that Krishna um, takes us all the way from our lowly position and Krishna through that line takes us all the way up so the lotus feet sometimes people say like i can't do it i'm too low i'm too fallen i'm too contaminated but that line on krishna's feet represents that he can even patita pavan he can even take the lowest and you see that line is very very thin that also the quran is mentioned has a double meaning that um spiritual life is like a razor's edge so one time Prophet said, don't be surprised who leaves, be surprised who stays. Because to practice spiritual life in this age is a razor's edge, like any inattention, and we can also get diverted from the path. So that thin line is also said to represent the razor's edge of Krishna's, uh, the path of Krishna consciousness. See these two squares that kind of come together to make an octagon. An octagon has how many um, corners? Eight. 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 So it said that those eight represent the eight directions. And what this represents is that when you take Krishna's lotus feet into your heart, then anything in the eight directions of the world becomes accessible to you. Like uh, a devotee can do outrageous, amazing, incredible things that they thought they could never do. Because as soon as you take Krishna's lotus feet, all the directions of the world can open up to you. Um, and therefore, yeah, devotees do. They do amazing things. They do things they never thought they could do because Krishna makes it all possible. The eight also represents the eight mystic cities. If you ever wanted to become a yogi, and if you ever wanted to achieve yogic perfection, you can do it all through Krishna consciousness. Become smaller than the smallest, become bigger than the biggest, become heavier than the heaviest. Uh, 
like that. There are eight cities. You can get whatever you want. That's a whole other class, how to get the eight <laughs> cities. <laughs> Has anyone ever been to Kumbh Mela? No. Okay. In Kumbh Mela, you can see people in the eight cities. That's also another class. Swastika. Su means very good. Asti means being. So swastika literally means that which gives well-being on all levels, physically, mentally, spiritually. Of course, later on, the swastika became, because of the misuse of it, uh, became like a very, very negative symbol. But actually, everywhere you go in India, and even in, it was used even in Western culture before um, Hitler used it, it was always seen as a sign of um, wellness and well-being on all levels. So that's there. And then this is a fruit called the jambu. I think jambu means rose apple, no? Is that what you'd say? I think so. That's what it is. And the reason why that's there is because it said that um, there are many islands in Vedic astrology. And we are living on an island called Jambudweep. And for those who are living on Jambudweep, their worshipable Lord is Krishna. And so the Jambu represents that Krishna's lotus feet are the worshipable object for everyone living on Jambudweep. The conch represents, uh, yeah, it represents uh, auspiciousness and like, uh, like if you ever have ghosts, of course, there's no ghosts here. <laughs> but if you ever have ghosts, then the sure way to get rid of ghosts is to blow a conch shell because they can't stand that sound so the conch shell is to, to represent the removal of all inauspiciousness in someone's life so that's what krishna does now these two concentric circles are very interesting um, this represents that krishna is inside of everything and at the same time, Krishna is all around us as well. So this represents that when you take Krishna's feet into your heart, then Krishna becomes installed within you. But Krishna is always, everywhere you look, you will also be able to see Krishna. Krishna will manifest himself in many, many ways. Krishna will appear to us in very, very many wonderful ways. The arrow represents that a devotee is on a mission to conquer. We have to conquer our mind. We have to conquer ignorance in the world. We have to conquer our pride. And ultimately, we have to conquer Krishna's heart. And therefore, the bow represents the victory that when one takes uh, Krishna's lotus feet, into their heart then they're able to make or conquer all of these things this here is the hoof print of a cow or a calf there's a very very famous verse in the bhagavatam samashutaye padapallava plavam mahat padam punya yasho murare that um, when one surrenders to krishna then the ocean of the material world becomes like the amount of water contained in a calf's hoof print. You know, sometimes there's mud and then a, a cow may come or a calf and then they create an imprint of their little hoof. And then when the rain comes, then that little imprint gets filled with water. Mm. So to step over that is very easy. So it said that when you take Krishna's lotus feet in your heart, then the material world, the ocean, which is so difficult, insurmountable, becomes just like you just step over it. You just like walk over it without even thinking. In other words, it becomes very, very easy. These four plots represent nectar. And that represents that Krishna's lotus feet, Purna, Amrita, Shvadhanam, that they give us the taste, they give us the higher taste that we're always looking for. Otherwise, we always, uh, in this world, end up chewing the chewed. 
We keep trying to find some nectar here, but it's not satisfying the heart. But Krishna's uh, lotus feet give that taste. The triangle, uh, that's for when your car breaks down. <laughs> <laughs> triangle represents that by surrendering to Krishna, you transcend the three modes. It also represents that you overcome the three miseries. It also represents that the devotee dedicates their mind, body and words. And it also indicates that um, one is able to go beyond the three worlds. Because there's the lower, middle and upper planets, but beyond that uh, is Krishna's abode. The moon, Nitai Pada Kamala, Koti Chandra, Shushitala. The moon is very, very cooling. So we are hot headed, what to say. We are easily angered, easily agitated, easily affected by all of the different things in the world. So when we remember Krishna's feet, we become cool, become calm. It's okay. Don't take the illusion too seriously. <laughs> And the fish is very, very nice because uh, the fish never swims in a dry place. You know, fish has to be where there's water, where there's movement. And so Krishna's lotus feet has a fish on it to represent that where the, where the devotee's heart is not dry. You can't be dry and be in Krishna consciousness. You have to be full of rasa full of taste, full of uh, sweetness, and then Krishna will come uh, and interact with you. So can you see, it's so deep. Uh, each one of these symbols you could uh, meditate on every day and say, uh, yes, Krishna, I want to take you into my life. Just see, if I take your lotus feet into my heart, uh, all these things will happen. We're trying to achieve all of these things uh, through so many things in the world. But ultimately, we only need uh, Krishna's lotus feet. Uh, but be careful, you might end up going to work and answering a call and saying, Govinda Dharma, <laughs> what are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened to the gopis. Because somehow or other, They just became completely conquered by Krishna. I don't know, sometimes it seems we have a flash of love for Krishna. Sometimes some flashes of attraction. But then other times we feel very, very disconnected. We feel very, very distant. So it's kind of coming and going. Like a bad Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> Sometimes we feel very connected and sometimes we're feeling maybe not. But somehow or other, to keep talking about Krishna, to keep remembering Krishna, to keep trying to be with sincere devotees who have some love for Krishna, uh, to keep just trying to engage with that spiritual energy and like this, just become more and more uh, fixed on Krishna's lotus feet. Uh, this is our goal. So these are some words I wanted to share with you for today. Hare Krishna. Uh, I don't know how it is. 8.45. How are we doing for time? Short Kirtan Maharaj and you make Prashadam and during Prashadam people can talk with you. No question? During Prashadam you can say questions. No, no question. One, two. Five minutes later. Otherwise, maybe question. then we have questions instead of Kirtan. Mm -hmm. Which one? Do you want to do that? Yeah, I think it's also nice to have a little bit of exchange. Yeah, so, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if anything came to your heart, came to your mind, uh, any question you'd like to ask. Or, yeah. <laughs> I have two questions. I think they're a little bit intertwined. I was wondering if there's a meaning behind the placement of the symbols, where they are placed. And also, while, why uh, some symbols are there in four or more, like mm. four nectar pots, and, and some are just one? 
Yeah, good questions. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to. <laughs> Does anyone know any answer to that? Mm -hmm. Are these in a specific positioning for a specific purpose? Mm -hmm. That I have no idea. And why are some of them four and some of them only one? I have no idea. Stomp the Swami. <laughs> Thank you. I will do my research. I don't know. Does have any? Want to philosophically speculate and answer? <laughs> I wanted just to make uh, appreciate the point that, of course, it's very beautiful. I mean, we sometimes look at our own and oh, what is this one? Get yeah. absorbed, you know, but there, there's some lives. But look at that, you know, and they're really like signals and symbols, and it means so much. And uh, it's all uh, connected, it seems like, with Krishna and his relationships. It's like things that actually are being displayed uh, qualities in his relationships with others. I like that. Yeah. that it's, it's all so, it's so connected. It's not just for him, beauty for him, but it's all. Yeah, it means something in connection with others, with his devotees. Yeah. It's yeah. so reassuring, actually. Yeah, it, it has so much there, meaning. But yeah. there's so much. It yeah. means so much. I think so. Like, when I saw this first, I saw it years ago, Krishna's mm -hmm. lotus feet. And what occurred to me was that... Um, like, when I looked at each one of the things that each of these things do... I realized like I could, I could map it to different activities that I do in my life to try and achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think like, yeah, I'll surrender to Krishna, but I got to get on with my practical things to sort out my problems in life. And, you know, and then a Krishna's lotus feet will come and, you know, but then you realize that Krishna is when we bring Krishna into our life. Through these symbols, we get a sense of when Krishna really steps into our life, then he's also expertly working on all of these things that we're trying to resolve through other means. Krishna knows what we need. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're struggling with. He knows that we can't conquer our mind. So there's a bow. He knows that we're struggling with the three modes, therefore there's a triangle there. He knows that we're uncomfortable in the world and nothing ever secretes, so there's a lotus there. He knows that we've got lust, anger, greed, therefore the disc is there. He knows that we're um, wondering, what's my future? How will I be maintained? Therefore an umbrella is there. In other words, for me, it just showed me how Krishna knows what we need. And it's not just like, yeah, surrender to Krishna and, you know, but I need to also work on the side to sort everything out. And Krishna knows. Of course, we still have to make our endeavor in the world. We still have to be practical. We can't, you know, but ultimately, like that umbrella reminds us that ultimately Krishna is my maintainer. So I just thought it's very, very purposeful. Because it helped me to realize that Krishna knows um, what we really seek in our hearts. Yeah. Is there a hierarchy in the, in the ways that the different symbols can manifest themselves into your life? Or is this something that's happening all at once? Yeah, is there a hierarchy in terms of um, how Krishna acts? Of course, all of these aspects of Krishna... Um, Krishna has a personal relationship with everyone and everyone's uniquely seeking different things and everyone's uniquely facing different issues and therefore I, I've never heard that it comes in a specific order but rather that at different points in a devotee's life Krishna will manifest many of these qualities according to the need according to the desire of the devotee and according to how Krishna wants to expertly bring that devotee uh, back to um, the spiritual world. 
So yeah, I think it's I think it's just very personal and very individual. And therefore, you see in the lives of all of Krishna's devotees, they all have very, very unique journeys in how they make it to Krishna. And Krishna does very, very unique things in each one of their lives to bring them closer. Um, so yeah, Krishna is very personal. Yes, anyone else would like to... Uh, Um, it seems that at least some of these qualities are um, connected to, as you said, that when we worry about things or we struggle with things and Krishna is there and he's able to help us with it. But aren't we in the minority? I mean, most of Krishna's devotees are pure, liberated, in love with him. They don't seem to need that all that kind of help to overcome their modes and all that. And maybe they feel that they need it, I don't know. But is that, it seems like many of these are there specifically for us. Or how would you respond to that? Yeah. In the material world, uh, we're perceiving these aspects like this because our main focus is to escape the material world. And therefore, we're, we're looking at Krishna's lotus feet very much through that lens. Um, but in the spiritual world, all of these things are um, ingredients and aspects of Krishna's personality, aspects of Krishna's character to increase the rasa of his uh, interaction with his devotees. So the same thing that Krishna uses for purification in the material world is used for intensification of love in the spiritual world. And therefore, uh, all of these things, you know, you'll see are also uh, present there and Krishna uses them uh, in different ways. Um, so, yeah, they're, uh, they're purposeful. Uh, in the spiritual world as well. I have another one. Feel free, Marge is here to answer our questions. Go ahead. Say any questions. Yeah. Well, um, so you were talking about rasa very briefly, and then we hear that Madhuri rasa is the highest rasa because there's a hierarchy, but like everyone in a certain rasa thinks that that is the highest so is the hierarchy then based on how much krishna enjoys it and does that mean that krishna enjoys more in madhurya rasa rather than in San santanash yeah so each rasa is is you can imagine it like say there are five bottles and one is one liter two liters three liters four liters and five liters um, but all of them are full. Then from one point of view, we can say they're all full. They're all perfect. Um, but from another point of view, objectively, when we look, um, then one is bigger, one is greater. But they're all full. So rasa is, I guess, something like that, that every single devotee in their rasa is feeling complete then why do we say that madhurya rasa is the highest because the intensity um, of what it churns in the heart of the devotee and the intensity of what it churns in the heart of krishna is superior to the other rasas does that mean that krishna enjoys madhurya ras more um, than the other rasas Again, it's a question, it's yes and no, because Krishna and Vrindavan is a, is a whole transcendental drama that requires all of those rasas. So although Krishna experiences his greatest emotions in the Madhurya Ras interactions with the gopis, Vrindavan wouldn't be Vrindavan and that whole 
scene of the spiritual world wouldn't be the spiritual world if the other rasas weren't there. And so the other rasas also serve to allow Krishna to experience the intensity of Madhurya rasa. And so instead of them seeing them as separate, or instead of seeing them as in competition, we can see that they're all complementary and uh, integrating to ultimately give Krishna many, many different flavors and varieties of experience. Is that So many um, ways to meditate on the lotus feet of Krishna, and I was wondering if you could pick one of the symbols because you know <laughs> it's difficult for people like me to be, see the whole picture and try to do everything at the same time. But if you would pick out one symbol where you say just meditate on that one, what, what would it be? I think for we for all of us at different points in life we're connecting with different aspects of Krishna's character mm -hmm. at different points in our life we are going through our own different struggles mm -hmm. at different points in our life we're seeking reciprocation mm -hmm. from Krishna in different ways mm -hmm. and so I also feel like it's dynamic like like even Krishna's qualities, like which of Krishna's qualities do you love the most or focus on the most? I feel because it's a dynamic relationship with Krishna, therefore even that is always changing. And so, um, so I feel it's very individual and it changes. And so yes, you, you may focus on different aspects of Krishna's character and Krishna's lotus feet that you feel for you right now are very, very relevant and which help you to connect with Krishna's character and how he's going to now act in your life. Um, yeah, and I guess if all of us would say like, out of all of these, which is your favorite? Yeah, you have like we would all, what's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> I would go for lotus. Yeah. The lotus. Yeah. Soft. <laughs> the umbrella. The umbrella. The circles. The circles. Yeah, we are all going through different things. We are relating to Krishna in different ways. We're seeing Krishna in different ways. Mm -hmm. We're feeling Krishna's reciprocation in different ways. Is seeking Krishna's reciprocation. So I think, uh, yeah. It's related to her question. I was wondering, I also got this, these books many years ago from Padma Lochan Prabhu. I think he was the one who first came out with yeah. this in the early 90s or something. And uh, so I got these books and I got all excited and I read them and now, so thanks so much for <laughs> bringing this back up. I was wondering, is this the way then to meditate or like, because it's a little flat. I mean, sometimes like, <laughs> sorry, Krishna. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, like when we, um, sometimes you get these nice deity pictures of Shishirada Gopinath. So I can like picture those feet of Gopinath, but this is like what's all on the soul. So is there any mm. like recommended way to meditate? Should we particularly meditate on the souls of his feet or, or? Also, like how he stands, or the nails, or what? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm sure it doesn't look quite like this on Krishna's feet. Maybe it does. I don't know how it would actually be. Um, you can meditate on this. I think more than this, the reason why I went through each one and try to explain a little bit about how that reflects Krishna's character. Mm. I think that's what we're meditating on. We're meditating on uh, how these symbols represent 
how Krishna is active in our life and how Krishna has already been active you know and I think therefore personalizing this into like Krishna's character and then seeing Krishna's feet I don't think you need to visualize these symbols as such but I think what's more is when we look at Krishna's feet and we remember, oh yes, if I surrender to Krishna's feet, if I instill them within my heart, just like the gopis did, uh, just see how Krishna is becoming so involved and Krishna is reciprocating. So, but if it helps you to also, you can also just put this, it's nice, no? You can just put it on your wall. And every day, just remember. I'm trying to solve all my problems in so many ways but it all uh, is the real solution there's no other solution um, you're speaking about reciprocation um, so Krishna's, uh, Krishna he chooses himself how and when he reciprocates with us uh, even with his mercy, it's costless. So it doesn't necessarily mean if we try harder or we try more that he's obliged to give us more as well. So it can be that we try more and more, we try and take more steps, but we not feeling like we are realizing this. So the path can be quite tough then sometimes. How to deal with that? Uh, so sometimes Krishna is reciprocating, sometimes Krishna is not reciprocating because we're not in control. I would say Krishna is always reciprocating. And sometimes his silence, sometimes Krishna's seeming inactivity, sometimes Krishna's sense of he's just absent, that is also part of Krishna's reciprocation. Because that's what Krishna does to the devotees in Vrindavan all the time. <laughs> and therefore the devotee says, Shlishyava Padaratam Vinashtuma Madarshanan. Adarshanan means even if you are not present before me, I know that even that's part of your reciprocation. I know that's part of your love. I know that's part of your transcendental character. And therefore that doesn't reduce my um my connection to you. And so I say, I would say that's the art of Krishna consciousness. How to perceive Krishna's reciprocation when it comes in ways in which we didn't expect or desire. That's real Krishna consciousness. Like this Christian monk, he prays, he says, God, I prayed for love. And you just kept sending me people who needed help. I prayed for strength. And you just kept sending me obstacles in my life. I prayed for wisdom. And you just kept sending me problems to solve. <laughs> then he says, God, you gave me everything I needed. But nothing that I wanted. And so it's very powerful because it's like we have a stereotype sense of how Krishna should reciprocate with us. And that's, the, and, and that's what I think defines a higher grade of a devotee when they're able to begin to see Krishna's reciprocation in ways that they didn't expect or necessarily desire. Krishna is an expert chess player. <laughs> I don't know if it was Maya, but we were on a flight from somewhere. So me and Gopi had a chess game. <laughs> kind of in interactive. And it was quite interesting because like, I don't know when the last time any of you played chess was. But I got a lot of reflections about, yeah, like from playing chess, like, how Krishna is actually the expert chess player. <laughs> because when you play someone in chess, you're just like, you can't understand, like, where's this guy going with this? 
But then you later on you realize, oh, he was setting me up in that way. <laughs> and the more you play it, the more you kind of get a sense. But then even then, like, and then I was saying actually that it's amazing that people have been playing chess for like 40 years and they still find it fascinating. Like it's still a fascinating game. Because it's almost there's unlimited ways in which that game can happen. So then I was also thinking like in the, in in reciprocation with Krishna, there's all you can never also figure it all out, like all of Krishna's moves. He always has a new move. <laughs> like how can you still keep playing chess after forty years? That means there's still new things that they're discovering in that. Um, so Krishna's repertoire is unlimited. Okay. Um, so, that, that we have to like get try to meditate and, and bring Krishna's lotus feet in our heart, <laughs> and then we have different ways that we can meditate on them, as we have briefly explained. Um, but it's not. Sometimes it feels a bit is that the word dissected, like it's just like just the feet. It's like also kind of impersonal, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, he's a person. He has feet. He has things on them. But it's a person, so we of course want to develop humility. But um, should it kind of begin with the feet and then, then go up also, like in visual the whole, visualize the whole deity or Krishna, or should we just kind of think well, just stay on the feet, <laughs> stay with the feet? Yeah. Uh, no, it's beautifully explained in the third canto of how we should meditate on the. On the different aspects of the form of the Lord and the different limbs. And just like Krishna's feet have so many uh, so many different meanings, the other aspects of Krishna's uh, body also have uh, beautiful meanings. So I, I recite a verse here. This is one of my daily prayers. Mm -hmm. Although I haven't said it for a long time, but you gave me a chance to say it today. Ha sam hare ravanata kilaloka tibra shokashru sagara vishoshana matyudaram sammohanaya rachitam nijamaya yasya bru mandalam munikrite makara dvajasya. Anyone know this one? A yogi should meditate on the most benevolent smile of Lord Sri Hari, a smile which, for all those who bow to him, dries away the ocean of tears caused by intense grief. So when you meditate on Krishna's smile, then it dries away the ocean of tears. The yogi should also meditate on the Lord's arched eyebrows, which are manifested by his internal potency in order to charm the sex god for the good of the sages. So Krishna's eyebrows are like, um, um, yeah, it said they're like a, a bow. And if you meditate on Krishna's eyebrows, then he, uh, he, he basically conquers your heart and he charms the sex god and therefore one will give up all uh, thoughts of uh, lust and temporary enjoyment. So like this in the third canto there's many many other verses which talk about different aspects of the Lord's limbs. Um, the previous verse says if you meditate on the Lord's eyes they soothe the most fearful threefold agonies of his devotees so try it just like stare at Krishna's eyes <laughs> um, and see so like that many many different things uh, yeah, his eyebrows so many things I'll mention nose cheeks they all have a meaning check it out later on. It's chatting, is it? 
Yeah. Uh, so three, Canto 3.28. Yeah. It talks about basically how to uh, meditate on Krishna. Yeah, I guess this should be the last one. How should we take each decision according to Guru Sadhu and Shastra? How should we take each? Each decision according to Guru oh. Sadhu and Shastra. For example, Sunday evening, I did not finish my rounds. I got a call from temple. There are services. If I complete my rounds, I please Krishna. But Vaishnavas will be in trouble. If I go and do the service in temple, my rounds will be last. Let me keep it more realistically. For example, now it's 9 10. If I take a prasadam, I cannot wake up tomorrow morning. If I want to listen to you more and stay here for one more hour, it will be late to go to the home. If tomorrow morning I will. Don't I will blame it on me. <laughs> and anything if I still want to wake up in the morning and complete my round, the day will be gone. It will be everything. Like, for example, today I finished my rounds in my office, in my in my meeting hall. So, office is for working. So, is it right to mm -hmm. utilize it and uh, take that advantage? Tomorrow, I will be adjusting my office hours, uh, my office work, and will be attending your Harinam in Rotterdam. Is it okay? <laughs> Guru and Sadhu and, uh, Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. How should I compare? How, to, how should I measure? Because I want to take, my decision should be correct. Yes. Uh... You see, when we say take decisions according to Guru Sadhu Shastra, ultimately that doesn't mean we shouldn't become individually thoughtful and sincere. And, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm in the prasadam line, he's offering me three chapatis, but sh should I only take two? Quick, Guru Sadhu Shastra, what's the... <laughs> Like, when we're interacting with Guru Sadhu Shastra, what we're trying to understand is the essence of how to please Krishna in the best way. Now, in any given situation, there could be two ways to please Krishna. For example, by serving the devotees or by chanting your rounds. So it's not that Guru Sadhu Shastra is necessarily going to tell you which one. Because in every situation, you have a personal relationship with Krishna. So in every situation, you have to become thoughtful to ask yourself, am I putting Krishna first? If you put Krishna first, it is the right decision. The right decision is not the decision to go A or B. The right decision is the decision in which you genuinely put Krishna first. No. <laughs> You're going to tell me, but how do I know I'm putting Krishna first? Or like, how do I know that? But there's no replacement for sincerity. So yes, sometimes you may just serve the devotees and it means because there was a need, because you really wanted to serve the devotees. That on that particular day you didn't chant your rounds. But if you genuinely did it because you wanted to serve the devotees, then I don't think Krishna is going to hold it against you. In other words, we have to genuinely in every situation just be sincere. Sincerity is the ultimate winner. Now, we always look for a formula. We always look for some kind of clear way. Because, because secretly what we're trying to do is not be sincere. Does that make sense? Basically, <laughs> 
basically becoming sincere means that we uh, Krishna consciousness is not like a, it's not a formula it's not like in in you know like there's a law book that in this situation this is what you should do and in this situation this is what you should do every devotee will express their devotion in different ways and Krishna is Bhava Grahi Janardana and he will accept that devotion, not the thing. And so, uh, if you can go in front of Krishna and say like, Krishna, I'm trying my best to be sincere. Now you give me intelligence. And yes, you send me the devotees who can help me develop my sincerity. Then eventually you'll know in every situation. When you become connected to Paramatma, Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam, Krishna will inspire you to become more and more connected. Krishna will instill you with that decisiveness to know what to do in every situation. But we have to be sincere. I was, I was thinking recently, like, when I look back in my life, sometimes I've made decisions. And when I look back now, I'm like, how in the world did I make that decision? Like there was no logical reason why I should be so, why I could have been so sure about that decision. But in that moment, I made that decision. And clearly what it says to me is that, I hope I'm not being uh, presumptuous, but that Krishna was inspiring me to just do something. So what happens when Prabhupada quotes this verse, Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam, you check it on Veda Face. Prabhupada says many, many times when he quotes this verse, yes, Krishna will tell you, do like this, do like this, do like this. And so gradually you, you'll, you'll, what does Krishna say? Jitatmana prashantasya paramatma samahita. For one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached. So the ultimate decision making is to be connected to Paramatma. But in order to get Paramatma, you need to conquer the mind. And in order to conquer the mind, you need the direction of Guru Sadhu Shastra. So, but all of that is ultimately just meant to make you sincere. So, I haven't given you any practical advice about <laughs> what you should do in any of the situations you mentioned. Um, but I think your sincerity will be the ultimate winner. Alright, so thank you everyone so much. Just make one quick